Hey guys, Henning and MJ from FlipNormals.com and in today's video we are going to show you how we did our jack-o'-lantern Halloween sculpt. Before we get into that sculpt, be sure to check out our Halloween art challenge where we have prices over for over $1,000 in cash. Link to that in the description. Tons of really cool entries already, so I highly recommend you check out that challenge. So in, um, in Seabrush we are just sticking to very standard stuff. The only, only non-standard stuff is a little custom brush here that I've been working on, on in my spare time. Maybe that'll be released at some point as a product, maybe not. Uh, we are just starting off with radial symmetry and then um, just to get the, the pumpkin feel and look for that. And then pretty much right away, we just start to carve it in. I'm treating this as, as an actual pumpkin carving to the degree you actually can do that in the sense that I'm, I'm carving it. I'm trying to not to add too much stuff to it, uh, adding a little bit here and there, but you can see I'm actually carving into the pumpkin, so it's a negative space. Just trying to get in the design, uh, or trying, yeah, trying to nail the design here. The design was originally made by my girlfriend Alpida, and we just worked on this together, where it was a bit of a collaborative thing, where uh, she drew, did a drawing, I did a sculpt, she did a paint over of the sculpt, and then I did a sculpt, more paint overs. So it's a really good way to work in a, like an iterative fashion with that. Thinking less about anatomy here and thinking way more about the actual design. You know, how much anatomy is there in a pumpkin head like this after all? So um, really just trying to nail the design. It's going to look kind of bad for some time and that's just because I tend to just try to block in the design. Really not thinking too much about too much of the sculptural quality and way more about just is the design there in terms of the proportions. And at some point you'll see that the design is there and then it's just going ham on this for, for some time. This kind of collaborative process is actually really nice because it allows you to, I mean, you don't have to do all the heavy lifting when it comes to, to the design. And also you tend to become a little bit blind to, to what you're doing when you're sculpting, I feel like. So having someone external that can come in, help you with a paint over or, or feedback or critique is always very helpful. Yeah, particularly when you're working with a concept artist or somebody, an illustrator or something like that, they just care about the shapes. If you if you can't get the shapes right, they're like, well, it kind of sucks to be you. You need to just get the shapes right. So it, it, and in 3D, it's so difficult to think fully about clean, strong shapes, simply because it's it's difficult. It's We're dealing with so many things. You're dealing with this point. You're dealing with design, anatomy, the three-dimensionality of it. You're dealing with it from every single angle. Well, if you're working with the design, you can really see this from from just like a few key angles and just work those those shapes up. Yeah, I find that when I'm working in 3D, it's like Kanae is saying, it's like you, you think about the whole thing from, well, in, in, in 3D, whereas often if it's a 2D thing I'm working on, then I'm able to let go of more of that and just focus on maybe shapes or, or more of like a pure design. And I think that's where it's really beneficial because you're not, obviously you still have, your drawings, your 2D concepts still have to exist in 3D space, but you can cheat a lot more. And I think it gives you a lot of a lot of freedom to be able to go fat back and forth between that. I I'm just at this stage just carving in stuff. Like in this point, we're carving in some of the nose anatomy, and sometimes we're just brutally carving in stuff for the design. But it's just to hit the notes. Like if it doesn't look good at this point. Don't worry too much about that. Just try to make it work in a uh, in a proper in a proper manner. Uh, just try to get the design to uh, to work, and then you can always fix that. I also tend to split up anatomy and design into two distinct stages. At this point, we don't really care, or the sculpt at all. We don't really care too much about the anatomy, but that, that's something I always try to be conscious of. Where design is one stage. Design can also be like pure observation as well, and trying to just hit the key shapes, and then. Just trying to go in and um, make the anatomy work nicely as a separate thing. I think that's a very, very useful way to think about sculpting. Pumpkin, like sculpting a real pumpkin would be so much easier if we had a move brush like this. Like you're just, you're able to tweak the shapes like in, in such a nice and dramatic way that you just, I mean, obviously if you used a equivalent move brush on a real pumpkin, it would just be the end of the pumpkin. Yeah, the whole thing would just collapse. I carved a pumpkin actually based on this as well, like just for a party the next day. And <laughs> it's it's so much harder to do that because <laughs> you also you can't add things to it. That's something I will, I'm so amazed by, but like stone sculptors, that they actually can't add things. It's entirely subtractive. That's so insane. 
here we are using the um, the smooth stronger brush as well. You know, we've been talking about that for a long time that you should be careful with the smooth brush, and you should be careful with the smooth brush. But there's there's a lot of power in a smooth brush as well. I think we should do a video on that at some point, like kind of a redemption of the smooth brush, because I talked to a lot of people who's like Henning and Morton said we should never use a smooth brush. Uh, can I ever use a smooth brush? I was like, no, of course you can use a smooth brush. It's just a tool, right? <laughs> so I think some people have a little bit of a dogmatic view on that. Uh, I find it to be really useful to use a smooth brush for sculpts like this, where not even sculpts like this, like all sculpts in a way, because the smooth brush just blurs everything. It's just a blur brush in a sense. And when you, you, you're you working with a brush like this, the, the clay brush here, the custom one, stuff gets very textured. So it's really difficult to see the clean shapes because texture is in this case just noise and we really just have to be sure that we um we get clean good shapes this is no matter what kind of scope you're doing you still want good clean shapes yeah i actually i tend to use the smooth brush quite a lot uh, it's sort of in a similar way that that you're seeing in this sculpt here where i'll i'll sculpt in the rough shapes and oftentimes that'll be very It'll be filled with texture depending on the brush. And the nice thing about the smooth brush is that it sort of brings everything together and it's much easier to get a feel for the actual shapes when, when everything has been smoothed out. So, but, you know, it, you use it with caution because if you use it too aggressively, then you just end up destroying your shapes. Yeah, the reason we're talking about you should be careful with the smooth brush is because it just blurs everything. And it's so easy to end up with a blurry result. But if you don't use it, then you also end up with texture everywhere and it's hard to control the texture. So it's it's just difficult. This is difficult to sculpt. <laughs> it's just a hard thing to get right. Yeah, I um, haven't really sculpted for, man, I don't know, a year, a year and a half. I've touched ZBrush a little bit, but uh, not a lot. I'm looking forward to doing more of that soon. Well, wow, what have you been busy with the last year and a half? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Something we'll talk about very soon. I often actually have issues with the uh, new transpose tool. And, and when I, whenever I encounter a problem, I just hit the hotkey Y. And that changes back to the old transpose lines. And you're like, okay, I'm good to go. I can do everything I need to do there. Unfortunately, one of the uh, few grandpa things I have with, with ZBrush. I think I've used the transpose lines for so long that um, sometimes the new transpose tool just uh, gets the better of me. There's some crazy power in this transpose tool. I want to yeah. make a video on that as well. There's so much cool stuff that nobody knows about. Uh, here we're just in Maya, just making a tooth. Uh, could you do this in ZBrush? Absolutely you could. I just find that I have more control in this sense. Uh, you could, of course, do this exact thing right in ZBrush, but one of the things I like here is that the topology is already solved. I find that if I were to make this from a sphere or something, or Dynamesh, or Dynamesh and C or meshing this afterwards, the topology is just not as clean. And doing something like that in Maya it takes you like two minutes to do. It took yeah. almost as long time to open Maya as it took to make the model in Maya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess with the sticklers out there, if you wanted to do everything in, in ZBrush, you could base it off of a cylinder and use Z modeler or something. It would be fairly quick as well, but you know, yeah. what, whatever 3D tool works for you is obviously fine. I feel I'm so done with debates about what's the best tool for something. Just, just, use, <laughs> yeah. just use whatever <laughs> works for you. And here I'm just trying to hit notes again, because at this point, um, LP that she just gave me a paint over. So you can see that sometimes in our, in our commercial tutorials as well, that there's like a chapter just called like feedback. And that's often when there's been like an inter internal feedback or just like me sitting down and just drawing over something in Photoshop, just because you, you were terrible at observing things the way things are. Like, it's just a thing we are not good at. We're very, very good at uh, understanding symbols and pattern recognition and all that kind of stuff. And that means that we kind of see the bush instead of seeing the individual leaves in the bush. So if the bush is moving, then we can see, we know there's a, probably a tiger or something in it, but we're not just seeing the individual things making it because then we would be far too overloaded. And it's the same thing with sculpting as well. It's just difficult to see things the way they are. So putting things into um, a, um, into an image image editor like Photoshop or even printing out images. If you're a bit of a crazy person, you can just see things you would never see before yeah i do the same whenever i do character work really 
I'll I'll have my wife come over uh, and 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 feedback it or like uh, Henning does with this sculpt here, do a paint over. It just it just takes a lot of that pressure away, design pressure, especially when you have talented people around you who maybe specialized in that. And they just sort of do their magic and you can focus on just the sculpting part. Easy. You just have a wife or a girlfriend who's uh, great to design. <laughs> there you go. Problem solved. Yeah. Problem solved. <laughs> if you don't have that, well, then you're, you're out of luck. Brush-wise, it's fairly standard stuff. It's a uh, damn standard clay buildup kind of it. <laughs> Not really a lot of other things in the sculpting cocktail at this point. You can see here that my approach, once the design is working, is this is where I just put on some nice music and I'm just going over the whole sculpt, like literally the whole sculpt. I'm, I'm refining absolutely everything. At this point, put on some nice Halloween-y music and just, just go for it. I find this to be a very useful tool, uh, not Halloween music, but going over the whole thing because you you tend to, like we just talked about, you tend to get so blind onto the work and areas that you thought were fine, they're not actually fine. And the moment you start to actually touch this with um, the clay brushes like, like I'm doing here, you start to see that there are there are just so many opportunities for improving the area. Like at this point, I think we're maybe around 12 million polygons or something like that. It's quite a dense mesh at this point and you can really, really get in into the details. We need more. HD geometry all the way. <laughs> all the way. <laughs> 120 million polys. That's, that's. Yeah, I almost did that for the masterclass we did, like the Blender Seabrush one. Like that, that got very, very dense. Let me tell you, Seabrush yeah. is not happy when you're recording <laughs> and you're doing that. Oh, wow. That was a big, big jump cut. So obviously, we can't show the whole four hour sculpting process in, in this video because that would well take four hours instead of half an hour. So, um, just jumping around a little bit. There is nothing new being added between it, really. It's just sculpting. It's just... Yeah, this would be a quite difficult character to, to create in 3D in, in terms of, like, the just the pure facial, facial shapes because it's... Yeah. It would have to push out so much volume around as well. That's one of the cool things that a lot of people don't really know about is that you... When something deforms, stuff generally squash and stretch. Like in this case, you can see his eyes. He's kind of like squishing his eyes together. There's little wrinkles around that. And that would be something you would have to figure out in terms of rigging, right? How do you deal with the addition of volume or subtraction of volume in certain areas? That stuff just takes a lot of time. Could be interesting for a, as a seabird topic as well, like using layers, for example, to create various, not, not full face shapes, but Showing examples of that where you would have compression and sort of expansion of the volumes. Yeah, it's a cool one. Uh, the uh, The gist of it is essentially that volume doesn't really disappear; it just kind of moves. So if you have, if you have like forehead wrinkles or you really like you, you really like pushing your eyes together, there's going to be more volume around your eyes and less volume on in your forehead. You know, it's the same thing with the rest of the body. The same thing happens everywhere. So if you you know you bend your arm. The, the volume that's in your biceps, it's it stays the same. It just gets contracted and, and squeezed into a smaller into a smaller volume, making it appear bigger. Yeah, it's almost like you have a water balloon, and if you were to like squish the water balloon, like the, the amount of water stays the same. You can't really change that by squashing and stretching it, but the the, the surrounding skin of it would change. Yeah. And now we're just going over the whole thing here. I'm just stylizing a little bit, just trying to go over with the uh, custom clay brush and just trying to make some nice planes. Same approach as before, just working across the shapes, and um, just been adding a lot of just been adding a lot of asymmetrical shapes at this point as well, like, like pimples and skin folds and all that kind of stuff. I tend to really go over the whole model, like this. Yeah, so at this point we're probably like around three hours and like 45 minutes or so very close to the end of, of that. So I wish I could sculpt this fast, but this is sped up by around 300%, I think. I don't let them know, Henning. This is all real time. Yeah. It's all real time. I have to sculpt in half an hour. <laughs> easy. <laughs> but yeah, that's it for uh, for this nice little spooky Halloween video. I thought I hope this was uh, was really was useful and that you enjoy this one. Be sure to check out the art challenge as well. Link in the description to that. And uh, MJ and I are back with tons of uh, awesome sculpting videos, discussions, software videos, news, and all that kind of stuff in the future. So be sure to leave a comment, subscribe, and click the little notification bell.